Hello Booktube, it's time for another essay. Uh, we're staying with Augustine Burrell, and uh, in the name of the Bodleian, and other essays, and published in 1905. Uh, today is Confirmed Readers. Dr. Johnson is perhaps our best example of a confirmed reader. Malone once found him sitting in his room roasting apples and reading A History of Birmingham. This staggered even Malone, who was himself a somewhat far-gone reader. "'Don't you find it rather dull?' he ventured to inquire. "'Yes,' replied the sage. "'It is dull.' Uh, Malone's eyes then rested on the apples, and he remarked, "'He supposed they were for medicine?' "'Why no,' said Johnson. "'I believe they are only there because I wanted something to do. "'I have been confined to this house for a week, "'and so you find me roasting apples and reading the history of Birmingham.' This antidote pleasingly illustrates the habits of the confirmed reader, nor let the worldling sneer. Happy is the man who, in the hours of solitude and depression, can read a history of Birmingham. How terrible is the story Welburn Ellis told of Robert Walpole and his magnificent library, trying book after book, and at last, with tears in his eyes, exclaiming, It is all in vain. I cannot read. Edmund Malone, the Shakespearean commentator and first editor of Boswell's Johnson, was as confirmed a reader as it is possible for a book collector to be. His own life, by Sir James Pryor, is full of good things, and is not so well known as it should be. It smacks of books and bookishness. Malone, who was an Irishman, was once, so he would leave us to believe, deeply engaged in politics, but then he fell in love, and the affair, for some unknown reason, ended unhappily. His interest ceased in everything, and he was driven as a last resort to books and writings. Thus are commentators made. They learn in suffering what they observe in the margin. Malone may have been driven to his pursuits, but he took to them kindly and became a vigorous and skillful book buyer, operating in the market both on his own behalf and on that of his Irish friends with great success. His good, fortunes, uh, his good fortune was enormous, and this although he had a severely restricted notion as to price. He was no reckless bidder, like Mr. Harris, late of Covent Garden, who just because David Garrick had a fine library of old plays, was determined to have one himself, at whatever cost. In Malone's opinion, half a guinea was a big price for a book. As he grew older, he became less careful. And in 1805, which was seven years before his death, he gave Ford, a Manchester bookseller, £25 for the Editio Pre uh, Precipits of uh, Venus and Adonis. He already had the edition of 1896. A friend had given it to him bound up with Constables and Daniel's sonnets and other rarities, but he very naturally yearned for the edition of 1593. He fondly imagined Ford's copy to be unique. There he was wrong. But as he died in that belief and only gave £25 for this treasure, who dare pity him? His copy now reposes in the Bodleian. He secured Shakespeare's sonnets, 1609, and the first edition of The Rape of Lucrece for two guineas, and accounted half a crown a fair average price for quarto copies of Elizabethan plays. Malone was a truly amiable man, of private fortune and enduring habits. He lived on terms of intimacy with his brother book collectors, and when they died, attended the sale of their libraries and bid for his favorite lots, grumbling greatly if they were not knocked down to him. At Topham Beauclerk's sale in 1781, uh, which lasted nine days, Malone bought for Lord Claremont the pleasant workings of George Gascoigne, Esquire, with the princely pleasure at Kenilworth Castle, 1587. He got it cheap, one pound seven shillings. As it wanted a few leaves, which Malone thought he had, but to his horror when it came to be examined, it was found to want eleven more leaves than he had supposed. Quote, Poor Mr. Beauclerk, he writes, 
seems never to have had his books examined or collated, otherwise he would have found out the imperfections. Malone was far too good a book collector to suggest a third method of discovering a book's imperfections, namely reading it. Beauclerk's library only realized £5,011, and as the Duke of Marlborough had a mortgage upon it of £5,000, there must have been, after payment of the auctioneer's charges, a considerable deficit. But Malone was more than a book buyer, more even than a commentator. He was a member of the literary club and a friend of Johnson, Reynolds, and Burke. On July 28, 1789, he went to Burke's place, the Gregory's, near Beaconsfield, with Sir Joshua, Wyndham, and Mr. Courtney, and spent three very agreeable days. The following extract from the recently published Claremont Papers has interest. Quote, As I walked out before breakfast with Mr. Burke, I proposed to him to revise and enlarge his admirable book on the sublime and beautiful, which the experience reading and observation of thirty years could not but enable him to improve considerably. But he said the train of his thoughts had gone another way, and the whole bent of his mind turned from such subjects, and that he was much fitter uh, for such speculations at the time he published that book than now. Between the Burke of 1758 and the Burke of 1789, there was a difference indeed, but the forcible expressions, the train of my thoughts, and the whole bent of my mind served to create a new impression of the tremendous energy and fertile vigor of this amazing man. The next day the party went over to Amersham and admired Mr. Drake's trees and listened to Sir Joshua criticisms of Mr. Drake's pictures. This was a fortnight after the taking of the Bastille. Burke's hopes were still high. The revolution had not yet spoiled his temper. Amongst, amongst the Claremont papers in a, is an amusing tale I do not remember having ever seen before of young Philip Stanhope, the recipient of Lord Chesterfield's famous letters. Quote, when at Burn, where he passed some of his boyhood in company with Hart, and, and the ex excellent Mr. New Lord, uh, or now Lord Elliot Heathfield of Gibraltar, he was one even evening invited to a party where, together with some ladies, there happened to be a considerable number of Bernese senators, a dignified set of elderly gentlemen, gentlemen aristocratically proud, and perfect strangers to fun. The, these most potent, grave, and reverend seniors were set down to whist, and were so studiously attentive to the game that the unlucky brat from, uh, found little difficulty in fastening to the backs of their chairs the flowing trails of their ample periwigs, and in cutting, unobserved by them, the ties of their breeches. This done, he left the room, and presently re-entered, crying out, Fire! Fire! The affrighted burgomaster suddenly bounced up and exhibited to the amazed spectators their senatorial heads and backs, totally deprived of ornament or covering. End quote. Young Stanhope was no ordinary child. There is a completeness about this jest which proclaims it a masterpiece. One or other of its points might have occurred to anyone, but to accomplish both at once was to show real distinction. Sir William Stanhope, Lord Chesterfield's brother, felt no surprise at his nephew's failure to acquire the graces. What, said he, could Chesterfield expect? His mother was Dutch, he was educated in, at Leipzig, and his tutor was a pedant from Oxford. Papers uh, which contain anecdotes of this kind carry with them their own recommendation. We hear on all sides complaints, and I hold them to be just complaints of the abominable high prices of English books, 30 shillings, 36 shillings are common prices. The thing is to be barefaced. Uh, His Majesty's Stationery Office set an ex uh, excellent example. They sell an octavo volume of 460 closely but well printed pages, provided with an excellent index for 1 shilling and 11 pence. There is not much editing, but the quality of it is good. If anyone is confined to his room, 
even as Johnson was with when Malone found him roasting apples and reading a history of Birmingham, he cannot do better than surround himself with the publications of historical manuscripts commissions. They will cost him next to nothing, tell him something new on every page, revive a host of old memories and scores of half-forgotten names, and perhaps tempt him to become a confirmed reader. And, yeah, I, I enjoyed that one uh, because it had Johnson in it and there's a few interesting anecdotes. But I like the um, uh, the Stanhope story because I have read all of the letters, uh, Chesterfield's letters to his son, and I enjoyed them. And I still read them. I've got a three-volume set or two, two or three-volume, I can't remember now, uh, set of uh, Lord Chesterfield's letters. Um and they're enjoyable. So there ends a bit shorter today, uh, which might be thankful to many, uh, the essay. And we'll be back again next time with another essay from Augustine Burrow. Have a good evening, BookTube. Bye.